Uh, PAUSI is one of two uh, national tier one supercomputing centers here in Australia. The other one's in Canberra, it's of course the NCI, the National Computational Infrastructure. Uh, we were started in 2014 uh, and we're an unincorporated joint venture um, between the four Western Australian State Universities and CSIRO and we get capital investment from the Australian Federal Government and ongoing operational investment from the State Government of Western Australia. We're, as part of that, we're uh, providing critical support for the SK infrastructure um, uh, north of Perth uh, and looking forward to the next phase of SKA and other activities. Recently, we announced uh, uh, the various parts of our current capital refresh, which we're at the um, kind of the final stage of at the moment. We're about to deploy um, our new supercomputer, which is very, very similar to the Lumi architecture at CSC. In fact, our uh, new supercompute uh, CPU nodes, uh, first of all, will arrive tomorrow morning at about nine o'clock and then things will get very busy in my building. But over the last year, we've been working on other things as well. We've been working on uh, the deployment of our new cloud system, which is an OpenStack infrastructure. Um, and, uh, and of course, today we're talking about our new storage facilities, uh, our new um, kind of refreshed um, 70 petabyte tape infrastructure and our 60 petabyte um, Ceph object store. And today, uh, Chris Chapalius, who heads uh, the tape system called Banksia, and Luca Cervini, who leads the uh, SEP object storage system called Acacia, here to talk specifically about those. Uh, I also want to mention that there's other infrastructure um, happening at Pawsey, of course. We have uh, various clusters for radio telescope operations that we've deployed over the last year. And we're in the process right now of deploying our networking restructure based on a 400 gigabit per second uh, backbone internet uh, for our new infrastructure that everything will hang off. Of course, the, the big part of that infrastructure is Satonix, our new supercomputer, um, at, uh, which up and running will have over 200,000 AMD Milan cores, um, over 750 uh, MI200 GPUs, um, system memory, um, a really big storage system, and that big scratch storage system um, is, of course, small compared to um, the um, the large, large volume storage systems, uh, which we are about to deploy um, and have announced. So on to that, I'm going to hand over to Christian Palias to talk about Banksia. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, so basically just a quick overview of Banksia project. Um, we basically wanted to achieve a number of project deliverables, as you can read for yourself there. Um, we had two uh, quite good Tfinity spectrologic libraries which have got a, a large amount of uh, JC and JD tape media. It has a large quantity of data stored for um, a number of projects, mainly uh, the Murchison Wildfield Array Radio Astronomy Project. And basically we went out to uh, request for quotation and we obtained some, uh, uh, some quotes back and we went through those. And basically what we decided on, which is uh, next slide, please, Mark. So basically, as you can see, um, it's a Xenon deployed diversity solution. Um, you can see in the, uh, the left, that's the actual deployment. So you can see there's a lot of expandability in those racks. So we can add in more cache if we wanted to, more front end nodes, and then pretty much the diagram displays um, the connections and the sizes of each of those components. So we're reusing the two Tfinity spectrologic libraries and we're basically uh, adding in a new uh, ScatterFest cache. Um, we're also deploying six new Intel servers, which provide a uh, S3 interface to said cache and also an API. So it allows users to request their data back and stage it to uh, those tape libraries. Um, so all quite hopefully quite clear and explanatory. That's basically what we deployed. We deployed nearly there. Yep. Still migrating next. Yep, thanks, Chris. Um, and I think, uh, Luca, um, after you, uh, to have a quick chat about Acacia. Yep, I didn't have unfortunately a nice picture like the one of Chris because we still didn't take any picture of the new cluster. <laughs> so, Acacia is uh, a Ceph uh, object storage only cluster and it has been uh, built to scale to hundreds of petabytes and for the future uses, uh, usage of uh, POSI and radio astronomy and the research data that we have to store here in Australia um, is a S3 
only API access. And um, at the moment with the, with the configuration we are thinking of uh, with 60 petabyte usable and separate, separated clusters for different research data. Um, what has been benchmarked and in the RFQ when we put it to the vendor. So the vendor is also Dell. I forgot to write it down here. And it's, uh, we have 12 racks uh, worth of stuff and with a minimum bandwidth of 45 gigabyte per second uh, to Cetonix, depending on the zones and the original coding profile used. Uh, we went to object storages. Everyone probably would know because it's much easier to share data with the general public. Uh, it can be uh, much more scalable than other kind of mounted file systems. And uh, we found uh, also having a look at the different options that the vendors uh, gave us uh, in the RFQs that uh, uh, going to Ceph and open source was probably the only uh, way to achieve a very large amount of storage with a minimum cost. If you want to go to the next slide, but maybe we should discuss this on the uh, specific Q&A. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's uh, 12 rack of storage, uh, fully populated with 228 storage servers and 24 service nodes. Um, there are, uh, the connectivity is 100 gig on uh, the on LACP on the storage nodes, while on the service node is up to 400 gig on LACP for uh, handling more traffic through the Rados gateways. And oh. that's it. Yep, thanks, Luca. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now. And um, uh, Pitari, uh, the floor is yours to have a quick roundup on what's happening at CSE. Okay, thank you. It's delightful to see that your building blocks are more or less the same that we are using here in Finland. Uh, I saw, saw the uh, spectral logic tape libraries that we are using in our archival systems and things like that. So I was like, hey, I, I've been using and <laughs> this and that. Anyway, um, so about the Lumi. Uh, we, Lumi is a, uh, this is joined before in Europe. So I, I think that you know where the, Europe is. So I didn't draw the distance between Australia and, and Finland, but uh, the, there is a, um, different groups that are putting their money in the same bucket and then building a thing. And in, in, in our northern area, we have Finland, Belgium, Czech, Denmark, Estonia, Iceland, Norway, Poland, Switzerland. Switzerland and Sweden that are uh, trusting that CSC in Finland is the one who is going to host the supercomputer. And uh, we are, of course, very excited that they, they trust that we will get this system up and running. So Lumi is gray or HP gray nowadays. So it's, it's the peak performance is the size of a Fugaku in Japan. And if, if you check the uh, uh, now, nowadays tiering model of, of uh, storage things, it's, it's really comparable of these big boxes or big supercomputers like a Fugaku. And uh, we have a uh, three different layers of uh, capacity or, or storage. And based on the uh, uh, this uh, procurement, we, we didn't have a full Ceph-based system. Like uh, I think that you, you are more, more heading to that, that way, but we, uh, we have a seven petabytes of extreme flash for, for those computational tasks. And then there is a last trip, which is 80 petabytes and just 30 petabytes of usable capacity. So in the end, we, we have a 40, 40 marketing 
raw terabytes, pet petabytes of capacity on, on Lumio. And the uh, Lumi supercomputer is, there is a GPU partition, which is AMD uh, based. And then there's, there is a conventional x86 partition, which is size of a normal supercomputer. We have also the Lumi K, which is Kubernetes part. So a couple of racks of Kubernetes cluster for, for different cl cloud-based workloads. And uh, uh, in a nutshell, uh, Rados gateways or Ceph object storage is really simple and boring. There's internet, so customers are coming from there or they're coming from the Lumi supercomputer. They are heading to load balancer and then behind the load ba balancer, we have a Rados gateways and then there's a storage. And uh, I was going to try to draw the uh, full picture, but it, it's so messy that I decided that, uh, because I didn't know uh, the, skill level of all of all the audience i didn't start to draw every network switches and things like that but anyway in nutshell we have a ceph pacific uh, based ceph cluster and we are starting with a er eraser coding eight plus three on on those storage boxes so we have a nvme uh, partition for, for metadata, and then we have a spinning disk for the storing the data. Uh, the size is smaller than yours, but I'm, I'm still very impressed about the size of this because uh, publicly uh, visible Ceph implementations, there is a one which is in a size between 32 slash 64 petabytes in in Ceph metrics and and uh, so this is one of the biggest open publicly uh, known Ceph clusters of course you will get the bigger one but anyway uh, we are we are just using uh, 126 uh, 26 OSD servers you have some like 200 and uh, and uh, we are putting uh, the, all those Rados gateways and load balancers behind the hypervisors. So we have a different batch of nodes for for serving the uh, like SSL uh, authentication and things like that. So they they will uh, give us some flexibility to move around or increase the number of Rados gateways if needed and and things like that. There is a network wise we have almost the same speeds that you have so uh, towards internet we have a currently 200 gig links but towards the HPC environment there's multiple 400 gigs to, from the load balancers. And basically the load balancers are, are uh, virtual machines running on those hypervisors. So we are, we are spreading the load even more with that. And we have some challenges. The timing is really bad and the time. Uh, there is a lack of, uh, chips so everything costs more than before the pandemic of course we we were lucky that we our tender and the procurement went forward before the full lockdown situation and then uh, the Ceph is evolving all the time so i uh, went big to write one to run uh, this size of the cluster. We, we've been running the safe clusters since Firefly and upgrading them on the fly 
up to Nautilus. And our currently biggest cluster, which is in production, is about 12 petabytes of usable capacity. And it's, it's running Nautilus. But well, you know that Nautilus is uh, end of life currently. So they are not patching that anymore. And we have found some annoying bugs. You can live with them, but, but it requires patching and things like that. And we also found a box from from Ceph master release, and we are we are making bug reports and patches also for the for that level. But uh, still, I think that the Ceph is a right way to go forward because you you can get the source code and you can fix those things and you can improve the uh, code. Otherwise, it it wouldn't be possible to do this size of deployments and well networking is also challenging since the size of the cluster we have 10 racks or 8 plus 2 and it contains 40 switches currently and how how to make the redundant uh, failovers and things like that whenever there's some power supply issues, for example, on our state servers or even on a rack level. So, so that 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 is the one thing which is in these ob object storage clusters dragging somehow behind based on if you compare this uh, traditional sun networks where you had a, a dual path sun networks and then then customers came from uh, like from Ethernet or different side of the machines. Uh, now now we have a, a different VLANs protecting the traffic so we, we don't saturate uh, customer links while we are moving around the data between the OSD, OSD servers. And uh, on the marketing slides and everywhere, they, they have stated that we have encrypted storage. Well, define encrypted storage. Yeah, I, it's it's like uh, well, yeah, fine. You can encrypt on a, on a disk level, or you can encrypt that on a on a, for example, on the source, which is I I think that the most. Uh, wisest thing to do so in case you have some sensitive data you should encrypt that traffic all the way from your measurement device till the storage because you can if you think that in, in, you you have to trust on the encryption you don't give anyone the key except you yourself and and uh, in a way, encryption is part of the educating the customers how to do proper data handling. So, so of course, we, we are aiming to make all the precautions of in case you take disk away from the uh, data center, it's unreadable and things like that. But, but it's always the thing uh how people understand the encryption on on a storage level and i think that's that's mostly uh customer training part because they are of course they need to do the computational things on on the on the encrypted data so they have to open the encryption and well it will also get complicated and in the side thing somehow or uh, is the authentication of S3. You will get your password and credential and they will stay forever, right? And uh, it's uh, in HPC environment, it's not good that you are storing your access key and secret key on, a, on your um, workload manager or somewhere in, in a way that it, you can uh, 
compute and whenever someone breaks your uh, supercomputer login node and steals your credentials well the encrypted data is gone in a way or every every data is gone in a way that you just gave them away so our approach currently i don't know if will if it will fly uh, fully but we are we are currently doing in a way that we are using expiring tokens so uh, no, a normal user will authenticate and he or she will get uh, expiring tokens that will last like five hours or eight hours or five minutes and then if 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 you get those uh, S3 credentials, uh, it it's not uh, you can steal the data on that time that the that token is active, but after that you have to authenticate yourself again to get those uh, data streams up and running. And uh, the amount of servers is also challenging because, well, we have 200 nodes, hypervisors, physical servers like OSD servers and the Rados gateways and monitor nodes and Grafana, things like that. And uh, without Ansible, I, I think that it's it's really challenging. Of course, you can use Puppet or other tools like that, but we are, we are going with Ansible on maintaining all the operating system level things on, on the cluster. And when we enter the production, it, it's, it will be really challenging because I bet that the HPC users, they, they can be really creative. They can, they can do things that you, you wouldn't even imagine that someone can, can do. And we have, we have already seen the claims of, of this kind of behavior with, with our Felpadapad of Alas cluster. So they can saturate the Rados gateway traffic with a clever genomic uh, GPU workloads. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to see how they can bring the uh, pro, uh, throughput down for, for our Rados gateways next time. And I'm really happy that I have uh, come uh, with some solution for all this. The biggest is my, my Ceph team, Hannu, Joni, Jukka and Pupu. Joni is also in, in this meeting. And I think that collaboration with, between uh, Pauci and uh, CSCS in Switzerland and things like that will help us with, with the Ceph uh, challenges that we are facing. So this is my somehow small So in case you have something to ask, feel free to ask. Yeah, thanks, uh, Peter. That was great. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, it, uh, quite um, uh, without really particularly planning to uh, CSC Finland and uh, Pawsey here in Perth, we seem to have found ourselves running on very parallel tracks when it comes to both what we're doing in supercomputing, but also what we're doing in storage. And so uh, there's a really fertile ground here for our centers to collaborate very closely uh, in the future. And we are in fact uh, doing that and building those collaborations. That's one of the reasons why I want to invite CSE to come to it. This little, this little thing really is just to um, uh, get a bit of a view into what it's like down here as well. So to the, now that's the presentations um, kind of over and, um, and this is an AMA and ask me anything. And so we really flow, throw this thing now open to the audience and uh, we're quite interested in the, any questions you might have about what we're doing, what we think about this technology um, collectively. Um, we did receive a few questions um, um, online um, in preparing for this um, talk. 
uh, for this thing today, um, which I'm happy to start with. If there's no one's got a pressing question right now they want to get off their chest, um, it's okay to just um, go off mute and ask your question if you want, or to just put it in the chat and we'll pick it up that way. Um, or just raise your hand. <laughs> sorry? Or just raise your hand, yep. Um, the, the hand raise your thing that will work too. Um, and But if I, if I miss you, then just yell. Um, or just, you know, go off mute and yell, that'll work too, um, whatever works. So um, uh, with that, uh, we did receive a few questions, which I'll throw open to whoever wants to ask them, really, answer them. Um, and the first question um, is, uh, what is your replication, what replication ratio are you using on your Ceph cluster, um, i.e. X3 uh, times three or blue store, say six three, are you spreading your Ceph storage across multiple sites? Um, this sounds like one for Luca. You're on mute. <laughs> I think you're on mute is the most said phrase of the last 18 months. Anyway, go ahead, Luca. <laughs> um, so, so we got, uh, <clears throat> we don't use replication uh, because replication is too expensive. So we just use that on some pools in our cloud system, but on Acacia, we are not planning to use replication aside from the obligatory places like the metadata, the metadata um, pool. Uh, we are planning to use and to test before uh, four plus two for uh, direct cluster support, but for storage more of uh, six plus three or eight plus three. And in the future, we would like to test also more extreme configurations like 11 plus two, but it's still uh, for the moment is out of scope. And regarding multiple clusters, so this, uh, this capacity that we have like around 90 petabyte row, we are going to split it into multiple cluster where in the beginning they're going to live separately, but in the future we are planning to create storage classes and uh, uh, maybe use the Ceph Cloud Sync module to backup as well most important data or very critical data to external providers like AWS or all the S3, essentially S3 compatible providers. I don't know if uh, you want to add something, Vitari. Well, uh, here in Finland, we, we are using 8 plus 3 on the cluster and uh, with the Pacific Ceph version, you can do uh, uh, some replication on on a, on a bucket level. So that might be a one way that we are investigated on a certain customers, but we are not using the, the separate machine rooms or separate uh, data centers for for the storing the S3 data currently on this Lumio data. Okay, and I see uh, my one of my best friends, uh, Mosin, has, has jumped on, um, and one of our um, kind of posy um, alma mater, Mosin's from Kaust in Saudi Arabia, and he's asked, um, uh, how do you synchronize data generated on HPC nodes on Lustre onto Ceph, and what, if any, is the penalty? Thanks. Um, I think ours isn't actually operational, so this is more of a theoretical question in our case. Um, Patari, maybe it's more of a it sounds like the kind of thing that uh, your researchers might be doing. Well, uh, we've been uh, providing a tools in our current clusters for the for the end users that they, they have. Like, uh, well, Allah's commands. Uh, so there's the data set of different commands that they can utilize for for store uh, storing the data between the or transferring the data. Of course, there it's not that transparent that you would like to have, but but we we have to deal on different uh, sciences at the same time, and uh, and when when there is a security layer involved, uh, we we have to uh, go on the level that you end user authentication is is the one which is effective. So. Uh, in case uh, our Lustra environment is compromised, our Ceph cluster is not compromised at the same time. Of course, the, if there is an exploit that exploits all the Linux boxes in 
globally well that's that's different thing but but we, we we are trying to separate the data in a way that in s3 and in our last environment there's a different administrators and different different uh like credential level is is securing the end user data so there will be some penalty of transferring the data but it's at least in by in our experience it's not that big that end users would suffer a lot what do you think luca it's more a bit of more experimental in our case because we're not quite we don't have it operational yet but how do you think this will work yeah i, I think that the penalty will be minimum and uh, the the only problem that we might face in the future was what uh, Peter was saying in the beginning, token expiration and credential expiration. Mm -hmm. It would be probably very nice having Slurm, uh, uh, not creating automatically, but I mean, having uh, tokens that expire when the run is finished, for example, for security reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably that is the next thing to think of. Yeah. I mean, security, I, I, I can say just from a, from a high level view, um, you know, you both mentioned security. Um, uh, security has really been um, a big part of our um, concern uh, during this uh, deployment and also part of our decision making. So we are very explicitly kind of moving from the an old infrastructure, well, uh, previous um, infrastructure where we deploy, depended on a lot of cross mounted file systems for doing a lot of our work and we're moving to more of an API based access to data. And it is to kind of really put um, some kind of uh, barriers between some of our infrastructures. You know, it's um, it didn't escape, you know, uh, um, our attention. You know, over the last couple of years, a lot of the, a lot of the larger HPC center um, intrusions have been on the back of cross-mounted file systems on centers, and then as far as the previous escalation through a mounted file system onto another compute resource and a further escalation that way, and um, it's it's quite undesirable. Um, Hopefully, um, as we move to less directly connected infrastructure, the, the opportunities for that kind of privileged escalation are um, uh, less um, available. Um, I was just so going to yeah. add to something else that the other thing is the post run batch scripting to move uh, data around after jobs are finished is important too. Yep. Uh, so that's pretty much um, post run and soon. You just copy the, the generated files over to. Um, CFS3 while you've got your token and then the job is completed. That way you can keep things um, in the right tiers that they need to go to. So. Cool. Chris, I think the next question is for you. Mm -hmm. um, and it says, uh, you say that you're using 2x replication on tape backup. Which cluster, Ceph or tape, do you consider better data protection and why? That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe I could, what we could do is I could, I could have uh, Chris um and 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 luca fight for this one and we'll just see. <laughs> <laughs> uh each has their place mark that's what i'm going to say so I, I think we demonstrated in the past that two copies on tape has been extremely valuable and it's certainly protected the data well uh that's not to discount any new methods of protecting data and i think the key is you need to characterize the protection you want for your data depending on its use and longevity so yeah. You know, if you want to keep two separate copies on, say, CFS3 and then underpin it with 8 plus 3, great. But do you have the money? Um, what's your operating cost like in terms of electrical cost, um, et cetera, et cetera. So for an at-rest storage, yeah, two copies on two separate tape volumes, it's great protection. But I wouldn't say it's necessarily better than online storage because one's offline, one's online. You, how can you get yeah, apples with oranges? I know. Like, a, I'm... You know, this in this particular um, deployment of our storage, uh, we very explicitly um, went down this path. I mean, we could have um, just spent an entire budget on a larger tape system, and um, and we would end up with you know quite a good large tape system. Um, and it kind of goes on to the next question, which is uh, comparing the capital costs of tape and um, this kind of Ceph infrastructure, but um, we. We really have decided to kind of split our investment in this way and kind of do fairly large um, uh, deployments of each, both in this case, tape and safe infrastructure, um, to um, 
ideally get the, the best out of both worlds. Um, you know, we want um, a large amount of storage, which has um, a higher level of availability and then necessarily is available on tape. Um, a big part of our data storage facilities here are around supporting um, the various uh, radio telescope um, activities. And uh, these days, uh, a lot of those projects use virtual observatories to actually distribute their data. It's basically a web front end to the data resource. And you really want um, a reasonable amount of backend storage, which is you know, available at latencies that are simply not available from a tape system. And um, that's, uh, that's, just, that's an ongoing need that we have. And it's, and it's quite large data sets that fit within that framework. And so um, you know, if we, we could get a lot of storage uh, from a big tape system, but you know, would it necessarily be exactly what our researchers need? It's not really clear that, that would it be. It depends on the frequency of use, right? So, I mean, you yes, have a large very... amount of archive data, which is very infrequently touched. Yeah. Um, yeah, the thing is, I mean, tape is relatively cheap if you look at the cost. I mean, it's two electric kettles worth of electricity to drive um, one of the, each one of the tape libraries is basically, you know, two, over 2000 watts. So it's pretty cheap, but you've got to add on maintenance. You've got to add on the cost in US dollars per enterprise media cartridge, the cost of a tape drive, etc. So when you start putting sunk money in, it's not as cheap as people think. However, if you went LTO, potentially you could save a little bit more money. Yeah. That said, I mean, Luke, Luke has done extensive characterization between the two, two different costs, but you know, it's it, this is pr pretty much as low as you can get online storage for in the cheapest dollars per TV usable. Mm, yeah, um, you could buy a, a factory solution and pay potentially five to six times the price per TV and still get, you know, if you, if you wanted to get the similar amount of storage. Mm. Yeah, in Finland, we have a at least in our team, we have this joke, which is partly too true. Uh, one copy of data is enough if you don't lose it. So in, in a way that uh, <laughs> if, if you trust that your data is safe with one copy, fine. Yeah. Normal laptops, for example, a uh, lot of researchers are trusting that their data is it's there. They are do, doing a heavy science on their own laptop. There is no backups, nothing. And they still trust that it's, it's safe there. But when we are going to uh, petab scale data sets, I, I think that the, there is a need for, for uh, different medias and even offsite, offsite copies of the data. Mm -hmm. And um, we've seen during past years, and there is a really nasty ransomware, uh, Bitcoin, ransomware things going on uh, there there has been university hospitals things like that that face that their their data is locked out of their reach yep. and when, when you have a tape which is offline and your data is in one copy which is offline you cannot write that over like you can write on, on online data copy or encrypt that data so so i i my perspective is that uh, data is not uh, safe if you just have one copy. But if if you if you if you if if, if you have a really precise, uh, 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 really good data that you have, want to store forever, for example, make a couple of copies and consider the tape as a one option because you can take that tape away from the data center. You can move it somewhere physically, and it's it's the re recovery options are better. Very stable. It's very stable, and you know you, you can load it like you say. You can load it somewhere else and obtain the data back. But the the other thing is, we're a research facility, so um, I mean, someone's going to be pretty keen to try and encrypt, you know, fifty six petabytes of. Um, me of data will take them quite a long time, especially if it's if they tried. But yeah, you've got to have security as well and multiple copies. I, I agree with you. So another question, uh, Chris. Um, I think it's back to you again. You mentioned yeah. LTO. Um, which generation of LTO tapes are you using, and which hardware vendor are the libraries slash drives from? Okay, so we're not using any LTO um, per se. So my my uh, value on LTO was it is 
a because there are more players in the market, it's a cheaper media um, format. Uh, we use Enterprise Tape um, from IBM. So basically, it's uh, we use JD and JC cartridges with TS 1150 um, tape drives. So as being Enterprise, they are slightly more expensive per TV usable than LTO. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't give you a, a value on LCO compared to enterprise tape. It depends on the, who you're purchasing it from and what discount you get it. But if you wanted to go cheaper, certainly you could use LTO as another option instead of what we've used, which is enterprise. Uh, we use enterprise because it has a very long um, failure rate between um, uh, what, rate between failures. So we can push the tape out to 15 years without any problem uh, because of the grade of media we are. That's why we can reuse it. Yeah, however, I'd like not like to run LTO for more than say five to seven years really before we recycle our data off those cartridges. Okay. So yep. So moving away from tape now and onto something a little bit quicker. Um, uh, SSDs. So there's a question here. Uh, this, I think this is to Luca and Putari. Uh, 15 terabyte PCIe SSDs are becoming common, their prices plummeted. 30 terabyte PCIe SSDs are also becoming available. Are you considering a change away from spinning disk in the next year or two? And will this also become the final nail in the coffin for tape backup solutions? Uh, yeah, you, I, start, uh, you start, Peter. <laughs> if you have money to throw at me, I will exchange all the SSDs to, uh, or spinning disk to SSDs but it requires more SSDs than just uh, capacity-wise uh, replacing the hard drives. Because uh, we saw uh, in our sites that when you lose SSD, you just lose it. It's gone, totally. Right. And if you lose a uh, 30 petabyte, uh, terabyte disk at once, it requires a lot of uh, replica transfers and things like that. When you, when you fail uh, spinning disk, it might be so that you are uh, losing uh, one bit or uh, one sector, and you can start your migration already on that point. Uh, but with the NVMe SSD, it's really sudden. When they start to fail, it will fail and it's gone. And it's, it's really uh, sad to see that uh, spinning this is disk is slow in a way of of uh, transferring the data comparing to NVMEs or SSDs, but but when when you want to make this one copy is enough if you don't lose it principle, uh, I still doesn't it it is it, the uh, reliability of of NVMEs or SSDs it's it's not still yet there that I wouldn't slowly trust that there is one, one NVMe only cluster for storing the data. Of course, the price wise, it's, it's not there yet. I, I don't have the money to, uh, for electrical bills and, and, uh, and uh, replacing all the spinning disks to NVMe's, but it might be. Uh, well, just, uh, yeah, just, uh, we were, uh investigating this few days ago and regarding the power for example the 15 terabyte uh, uh, samsung ssd uh, there's more or less the same power consumption of the spinning disk at the same capacity uh, i didn't check the 30 but the 15 is more or less there uh, for sure as Vitari was saying is very i mean at the moment the time the, the prices are going down but it's still uh, at least I don't know what kind of discount you can get in the enterprise because we never asked for quotes on this, but uh, yeah, at, at least in terms of uh, uh, retail price, it's still three times the price. So it's not retail, really... it doesn't tape anytime soon, is it, Luca? <laughs> no, I am not in the next year or two, I guess. I've been hearing that for the last seven years that it's going to replace tape, and um, it's a really nice push from chip enders, but um, but we still, still have tapes. You still have tapes and yeah, like Darius, you're putting all your eggs in one basket and if it goes bad, bang, you just- I've been hearing that disc's gonna replace tape for 20 years. 
<laughs> so it just depends how long you've been around. Is it a call as to how long you've been hearing that? Uh, Crank out the marketing. <laughs> I will say uh, there was another question actually around the the um, the difference in capital expense uh, versus uh, our tape and uh, and disk based systems and. Um, just at the at the capex end, you know, in our last procurement or last few procurements, um, the on a per petabyte usable basis, uh, our disk systems, uh, this this CEF system is about twenty percent more expensive than um, the tape system at the same volume. So when you when you mirror the tape, right, and and build some resiliency into it, so they're not that different, like in cost. Of course, there are ways to build cheaper tape systems that can cut that cost down quite a bit. Um, and so if you really want to build the low cost um, tape system, there's, there's ways to do that. Um, uh, in our particular, in this particular infrastructure, what we're doing here is we're reusing about probably 10 to $15 million sunk cost in tape. And we didn't want to throw that out. That seemed like a pretty wasteful way to go. So we wanted a deployment where we could reuse our existing tape and not have to rebuy it, um, which is why we're doing what we're doing on the tape side. Um, but, you know, there is a... Um, there's still a you know place for tape. It's you know from an energy point of view, it is still it uses much less energy. So um, it it really uh, it depends what you're um, what you're trying to do, and I think it ultimately comes down to what your users are trying to do. If users are plonking ten petabytes of data on a system and they're not going to look at it for six months, but they still need it, then you know why put that on disks? It's just a it's just kind of a waste of a waste of money, really. Even if even if tape's twenty percent cheaper in that context, it's still not a bad idea. Um, it's just your users have to be able to, you know, tell you that that's what their use pattern is going to look like. And they can't always do that. It's more, their life's a bit more complicated. Um, right. And I saw, also note we're coming up to the, coming up to the hour. Um, so we've got like five more minutes. And I think there's, um, if there's a couple more questions um, from the audience, I think we've covered most of the questions that were sent to us. Um, um, Paul, you're building new big, you know, uh, systems over there in uh, Nectar land. Uh, are you guys um, building more um, kind of Ceph storage and what are you doing? Well, yeah, we pretty much mostly use Ceph now. But the, the interesting thing is we've been pushing, which, which I did want to ask a question about, is we've been pushing people for quite some time to use more object storage as opposed to, you know, file-based mm. volume storage on the cloud because yeah. it's, you know, cheaper, it's accessible elsewhere, et cetera. But we get a fair bit of pushback from people. People like their file systems. Most software only runs, you know, so runs if, if it's sort of talking to a file system. Yeah. Um, but you've essentially taken that option away and said you must use uh, object storage. So that's interesting. I, um, I imagine in the HPC world, that's probably not too problematic because people are probably used to copying their data to and from scratch systems to run their HPC jobs anyway. Yeah. But uh, I'm wondering if... Uh, you know, cloud users or other users, this is this is going to be a problem, or you expect it to be fine? Um, well, I will tell you um, of the in of the technology migrations that we're going through at Pawsey. Um, the big one here is uh, for our new supercomputer is the migration to GPU heavy workloads for science science modeling, and the other one is migration to object storage as a way of storing data here. So those are the two. So we don't take it lightly. Um, I mean, on the one hand, you know, our scratch file system on Cetonix, um, just like at Lumi, is a big luster file system, and it'll be very traditional kind of access. We we see really this uh, this big object storage system as in some way kind of replacing tape for people that probably shouldn't have been running on tape in the first place, and so. They're moving on a system which, well, while not an object storage system, had quite a similar kind of space and kind of workflow world. And so moving to an S3 storage where they're moving data in and out to get stuff done is quite similar to how people were, were actually accessing data of tape, except that the latencies will be better in this tape, in this new disk system. So I don't, the, the main difference there is it, they're just running a different command, you know, in terms of how they move the data backwards and forwards. They were always moving data backwards and forwards. So it's not that big a migration in some ways. Regarding, um, the, regarding the cloud user base, uh, we actually got a lot of interest and requests to move to object storage even prior our decision from the cloud users. Yeah. Um, okay. Obviously, in the future, we are not going to provide. So now we, we can provide very large quantities of block storage for cloud. 
but I don't think that this is going to be the case in the future. And while we will, we will cap the, the block storage to a certain limit, and then if you want to store more, you have to use the object storage. Yeah, I think we can thank the commercial storage vendors of the world for hastening this a little bit. I mean, you know, S3 obviously is an AWS mm -hmm. thing and, you know, the others are doing similar stuff as well. And so if you're working in that kind of DevOps kind of cloud environment, you are already doing this. It's not such a big transition. It's um, if there's a transition, it's really for the kind of um, people who don't work like that, the non-cloud users. The, yeah, exactly. You see people, right? Um, <laughs> And, and for them, again, at least at our center, you know, a huge, um, a huge portion of the usage of the infrastructure here is, of course, radio astronomers. And they're, you know, they're used to, um, you know, mostly working on tape for all their infrastructure. It's meant we've had a very crowded and busy tape system. So we're hoping to, in this infrastructure, move a lot of those users onto the object storage and give tape a bit of a break um, and uh, let tape kind of catch up and also change a little bit the way we use it. So it's more, archive and less just operational you know storage so yeah i i think that the biggest thing is to educate uh, uh, users of hpc and uh, storage environments in a way that they're using the most efficient way of of this data block object storage options so, mm. so i i think that the, that tape is not going away on a certain areas uh, spinning this their spinning disks have their place of course there there is uh, nvmes that are faster but but uh, there is a when, when you're using your, your tools right it's surprising how you can uh, make your science uh, on a tape for example so i i think that the how uh, People understand where the data is streaming back and forth. It, it's 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 the thing that we, we need to emphasize on on at least in here in Finland. And I I think that that's all, also in in your challenge how to educate the people. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I I, I mean, I, I guess my general and maybe closing note because it's one fifty nine is that <clears throat> the future for us is. It is tape and object storage, right? And and the tricky part is just getting the right ratio, right, um, uh, of those things and working out exactly what is the optimal way to invest your resource. Um, the um, at least you know the HPC center and um, and so you know in the future we'll be expanding both um, in just in ways that make sense. And then, um, uh, but the the immediate challenge really absolutely is uh, around educating users and helping them to understand you know how to migrate to this new thing, new, this new thing, S3 storage, object storage for a bunch of users who might not be that familiar with it because you know the, the, it's it's not the cloud users we're trying to migrate here. It is the HPC users and um, the uh, as Lucas said, the cloud users on our cloud system they've been kind of. Uh, metaphorically grabbing us by the lapels for the last year and going, why don't you do object? Come on, you've got a cloud system. Why doesn't it do object storage? And um, and we're kind of like, you know, uh, give us a break. We're trying very hard. Anyway, so, um, um, and uh, I, I do expect, um, you know, some uh, little hiccups as we're um, migrating over. I will say, um, you know, our team, actually, I, uh, my uh, good friend Lachlan Campbell just joined on. Uh, Dr. Campbell is actually one of our staff. He's working closely with radio astronomers here to make sure that they're fully prepared for this migration to object storage. And they're uh, really embracing it, as far as I can tell. Um, it's uh, obviously it comes with some challenges. They actually have to uh, directly uh, change workflows to be able to accomplish this. But they also understand that it's going to provide them with, in some areas, a significant improvement in the performance of that system and the way that their workflows work. So um, yeah, um, they, I wouldn't say they're, um, they're pretty happy with what we're doing. I think they, they're, they're cautious about it, but they, you know, um, and then there's the rest of the users who um, will provide a lot of tooling and education around, especially over the next six months as we're getting this all up and running. Um, now it's 2.02 and uh, this thing's supposed to end at two o'clock and, and Patari and our Finnish colleagues, they need to go and get their second morning coffee. It's pretty early over there. Um, uh, so um, I think um, if there's no last minute questions, I think we might call it here. Um, and um, 
Uh, I'll just give one moment of silence for anyone who wants to pipe up and ask something that's burning. No, I don't think so. Um, but cool. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And um, to our colleagues in Finland and around Australia, um, please stay safe. Um, we look forward to seeing you all again soon and um, look forward to seeing everybody in person at some point. That'd be great. Um, obviously, it will be a little while, um, like a year, who knows, but, you know, someday. And um, uh, uh, farewell, everybody. And uh, I, there will be a, this session has been recorded. So if anyone wants to grab it or share it afterwards, um, that should be no problem. Um, and Aditi, our marketing person, will be in touch with um, registrations to um, give you the recording if you need it. So thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great afternoon or morning, wherever you are. And um, thank see you. Yep. Thanks, Mark. It's good. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.